Good morning and welcome to Holy Cross Lutheran Church as we gather uh, together on this uh, Labor Day weekend. It's uh, either the last weekend of, long weekend of the summer, if that's, uh, uh, if you're looking back or uh, if you're uh, more inclined to look forward according to the signs that at most of the Tim Hortons in town, it's the first uh, weekend of the pumpkin spice season, uh, if that's something that uh, is of um, importance to you. Uh, regardless of how you mark the time in the secular world, it is also the 14th Sunday after Pentecost, uh, according to church time. And uh, we are going to continue our journey that we've been on for a while now, looking at uh, various readings from the letter to the Romans. And uh, given the world that we're living in today, a world of all kinds of upset and uh, confusion and uh, frustration with governments and uh, ways of thinking that have uh, existed for centuries and COVID and all of that, uh, it's hard to think of a more appropriate reading uh, than what we're going to hear this morning from Romans chapter 13, where Paul talks very candidly about the relationship that we as Christian people are to have with uh, the governing authorities. And he's going to talk to us about obedience, and he's going to talk to us about our taxes, and he's going to talk to us about honor. But most importantly, he's going to talk to us about love. So, wherever you are, we welcome you to uh, the service this morning. Uh, if you are on our congregational email list, you received a bulletin back on Thursday. Uh, if you haven't downloaded that, you can just go to the church website and you'll find it there. And you'll also uh, see the words uh, to the various parts of the service as they appear on the screen momentarily. Our opening hymn this morning is, All You Works of God, Bless the Lord. We join together to sing. liturgy this morning follows divine service setting number three uh, from our hymnal, and uh, we will join together now in the invocation, confession, and forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made, made heaven, heaven and earth. earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and, and you, you forgave the iniquity, the iniquity of, of my sin. sin. Amen. 
O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, I a, a poor, poor miserable, miserable sinner, confess, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this year confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of Christ, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you for all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. How great are your works, O Lord, your thoughts are very deep. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, not just think them, but also accomplish them, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. turn our attention now to the scripture readings for today on this uh, 14th Sunday uh, after Pentecost. Uh, our Old Testament reading comes from the prophecies of Ezekiel in the 33rd chapter, where the Lord reminds Ezekiel of the task that he has been given, and that is to be a watchman over the house of the Lord and to warn people about their sin. Uh, you'll hear a similar theme from Jesus in the gospel reading as he will talk to us too about uh, how we deal with one another, uh, particularly when uh, sin uh, comes into the relationship. But first from Ezekiel chapter 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you will give them warning. From me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person will die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way. That person shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. 
The second reading uh, this morning is from the 13th chapter of Romans. It will be the text for the meditation, and uh, we begin reading at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger, who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For this same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. But owe one nothing except to love one another. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. We're going to hear an anthem now. Uh, In the Garden, sung by Joyce and Sarah Keane. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still He walks with me and 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put them in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, And one of them has gone astray. Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go search for the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to to listen even to the church... Let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. Among them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. We join together now to confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn of the day today is a hymn called, O God of Mercy, God of Might.
each and every one of you God's grace and mercy and peace through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, our focus this morning uh, will continue our journey through the letter to the Romans, and uh, in particular, as I said at the beginning of the service, we're focusing on uh, Romans chapter 13, our second reading that we shared a few moments ago. I won't uh, reread it to you now. All roads lead to Rome, or so the saying goes. The saying didn't uh, come into existence until the 1500s sometime, but uh, it had a ring of truth to it, because back in the days of the Roman Empire, the roads led to Rome. In fact, Caesar Augustus, the uh, uh, Caesar at the time when, every, when Jesus was born, the one who sent everyone to their hometown to be uh, included in the census, he erected uh, right in the forum in uh, Rome, right outside the temple of Saturn, something called the Golden Mile Post. It, it wasn't really gold, it was bronze, but um, nonetheless, that was its name. And on that mile post was the distance from Rome to all of the major cities of the Roman Empire. And it was there from the center of the city of Rome that uh, the roads fanned out to the various places of the empire. Rome was known for its system of, of roads that made it easy for people to travel from place to place, but the real reason those roads were there wasn't just to get stuff from one place to another or to give families an easy way to get out of town for the weekend or that sort of thing. The real reason those roads existed was for the army. So that the power of the Roman Empire could be shown at any place in the empire in a relatively short period of time. And so the road stretched from Rome all the way to the wall of Britain in the west and all the way to the Euphrates River in the east and up the Danube and up the Rhine and all those other places in between. And soldiers often were stationed along the sides of the roads so that they could be quickly dispatched to a place where trouble was starting to show itself and put the trouble down and sort things out. The roads were all about the power of the empire. And Paul knew about that Roman power. He knew the good of it, and he knew the bad of it. The good of it was that when he was arrested in Jerusalem, towards the end of the book of Acts, he could appeal his case directly to Rome. He didn't have to really deal with the people Rome had sent out to try to govern uh, the, the area of Israel and Judea and Palestine, those areas. He, he could ap appear before them, but then he could appeal to go further to Rome. And Paul took advantage of that so that he could bring the gospel ultimately to Rome. That's what he really wanted to do. But he also knew the downside of Roman power. He had experienced the wrath of the Roman government. In Acts, we read that when Paul was in Philippi, for example, they converted a fortune teller. And when the men who profited over this fortune teller's work found out that she had been converted, they appealed to the magistrates because they had lost their source of income. He had, he had taken away their business. And Paul was beaten at the order of the magistrates for what he had done. And just six months before he writes the letter to the Romans, he writes the letter we know as 2 Corinthians. And in that letter too, he talks again about being beaten by the Romans at a different time. And then, of course, we know that Paul had been imprisoned by the Romans. He knew the weight of the power of the empire. 
And part of why he writes the letter to the Romans in the first place is that he knows that the church there in that city, even though he's not yet visited it, he's heard that the church in that city is now beginning to come under persecution. The full wave of that persecution hasn't really come yet, but it's, it's starting to be felt. A fellow named Nero is the emperor by the time that Paul writes. And you don't have to know much about Roman history to know that Nero was not a very nice guy. He talked a lot about peace, talked a lot about uh, you know, building the peace of the empire and the Pax Romana and stuff like that. But if you went into Rome, Nero's opponents were poisoned faster than a certain U.S. president can pardon his cronies. He got rid of people who he didn't like. Got rid of them once and for all and for good. And I think that makes what Paul has to say to the Romans rather astounding, actually. That in the face of his own experience with Roman abuses of power, in the face of the upcoming persecution of Christians, Paul doesn't tell the people to take to the streets in rebellion. He doesn't encourage them to start rioting. He doesn't even tell them to tear down a statue somewhere. And goodness knows there were a lot of statues in the Roman Empire of a lot of fairly nasty people. No, no, no. That's not the Christian way, he says. Instead, he says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Every person, including the Christian people. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. So then whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. The ruler, no matter how unsavory he may be, no matter how difficult his policies may be for people to accept. The ruler, Paul says, is actually exercising authority from God. All power belongs to God. And God, in his wisdom, has allowed for some of that power, the ruling of the temporal affairs of life in this world, deciding where the roads go and enforcing the basic laws of society, he has entrusted that over to governments. And there are good governments, and there are bad governments, and there are good leaders, and there are bad leaders. But that's not ours necessarily to worry about too much. It's ours is to obey, to be subject to those rulers because they are exercising the authority of God. And not just to be obedient, but also, as difficult as it is sometimes, to pay our taxes and to show to those who govern us the respect and the honor that they are entitled. We sometimes hear those words. I think three years ago we'd have heard those words and kind of just passed right over them. Of course, this is what you do in a civilized society. You obey your rulers. But it's not three years ago. It's 2020. And the year we've had this year makes these words probably as, as interesting to us as they were to the people in Rome 2,000 years ago. Because these are words that uh, remind us. that say, for example, we don't like what the government or the health authorities have decided about COVID and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And I can tell you, I struggle with that too, sometimes. I don't like wearing a mask. I don't like the fact that uh, church attendance is capped at a third of the people. I don't like to see all our programs set aside and all the things that we do here. Yet, for the sake of public health, we obey. 
We obey those rules. We follow those rules. Why? Because following those rules is not just following and showing respect to the government that uh, is placed over us, but showing respect to one another, showing true love for our neighbor. That's the real calling that we are about here. And whether we like the rules or don't like the rules, whether we think the whole thing is a little bit overblown or whether we think that the government hasn't done enough, we follow the rules. We do what we can as best we can. Or when we look at some of the other things that are going on in the world today, the, the cries over racism, which are very real cries. Racism is alive and well today as it ever has been in this world. We'll never outgrow it. People will always look at each other in, in different and strange ways, whether it's based on color of skin or background or accent in your voice. That's ingrained into us. But how do we deal with that? Paul would suggest, I think, that the best way is not necessarily to take to the streets and start rioting and tearing things down and ripping statues down and causing all other kinds of violence and mayhem. Yes, it makes a statement. But is it the statement that really needs to be made? Is there a more effective way of making that same statement, like embracing the people around us, caring for the people around us, and showing them that same love that we would want to be shown ourselves? As Jesus tells us, it's not the stuff outside of us that makes us unclean. Our society isn't bad because it has statues of certain prime ministers still up in various places. What comes, that's not what makes people unclean. What makes us unclean is what comes from in here, in my heart, in your heart. And that's where the real war against racism and all of the other problems that we have in this world really need to be fought. And these will also be important words for us to remember as we go forward. Things are not getting easier for the church. They're getting harder. It was a bit of a slap in the face in a certain sense to be told that we're no longer considered essential, at least from a, a corporate kind of standpoint in this world. And to be told a few months ago that, you know, for, for the good of all, it was best that we close. A time will probably come, and maybe in my lifetime, maybe not, who knows, when it's going to get harder still to proclaim the gospel, particularly if you insist on a more conservative interpretation of the gospel, an interpretation of the gospel that really does believe in Jesus Christ, that really does believe that there are absolutes and rights and wrongs and things like that, and that rights and wrong isn't changed by what the world happens to embrace at any particular given time. But even then, as Paul counseled the Romans, so he, he counsels us. That's not time to take to the streets. It's not time to start rioting and looting and causing all kinds of other mayhem, but to use as our example the very Lord Jesus Christ, who when he was oppressed, when he was persecuted, did not in turn return that with the anger and the upset. Well, his disciples wanted him to do that, didn't they? That night that he was arrested, they were ready to take up the sword. They were ready to have the fight. They knew he was an innocent man. They knew what was likely going to happen to him, that he was going to die, and it wouldn't really matter whether he was innocent or not to Pontius Pilate. But Jesus said no. You want to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. This isn't the time for swords. And Paul shows us that and reminds us of that. That we are to live in obedience. Why? Well, not just to be obedient. But Paul knows something that we sometimes forget. Paul knew very well that most of the roads of the Roman Empire led to Rome. But Paul also knew of other roads. He'd been on one one time, on a road to Damascus. 
And while he was on that road, something happened to him. The Lord Jesus came to him, converted him from his anger, his hatred, and showed him yet another road, a road that led out of Jerusalem, not a very exciting road at all because it really just led out to the city garbage dump where Jesus himself had walked and where he had carried a cross and where he had journeyed to go to battle with all the forces of evil in this world. Not all roads lead to Rome. There's one road that leads to the cross, the road of love and service, where even though he was persecuted, even though he was innocent, even though he was unjustly charged, even though his rights were violated, even though his own had fled from him. Jesus still walked there for you and for me. Walked there right to the very end to dying on that cross that was planted there on the top of the hill called Calvary. And in doing that, he really conquered not with might, not with strength, but with love. With the love of the Father for you and for me and for this entire sinful world. He conquered Satan. He conquered Satan. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He triumphed over it, not with armies, but with his own flesh and his own blood shed for you and for me. And because of that, we as his people are called to walk a different road. A road that's not all about power, not all about vengeance and putting every wrong to right in this world. But listen again to Paul's words from the very end of our epistle reading this morning. Oh, no one nothing except to love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. And then he lists off some of the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. All of these commandments, he says, are summarized in one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to your neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, dear friends, is the road upon which we are to walk. Not the road that leads to Rome, not the road of power, not the road of riot and insurrection, not the road of thinking we are somehow above the laws of the land, but the law of love. That that law that was fulfilled for us by Christ when he in love walked the road to Calvary, might also be fulfilled by you and me in our own lives as the one debt that really we continue to repay as we walk the different road. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. On the screen in just a moment, you'll see the words to our offertory, Create in Me. We join together to sing. <laughs>
throughout the week and online and in various other ways. The members of our congregation continue to bring their tithes and offerings to the Lord, and we present those now to our God uh, in thanksgiving for what he has given to us. Loving God, we are gathered together to listen to your word and to witness to its truth. We give you joyously today and dedicate our offerings to your work. We are inspired to share your glorious love with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Increase our talents and offerings so that your name is exalted with unending praise. We give thanks to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In our prayers this morning, we continue to lift up to God our uh, uh, former visitation pastor, Pastor Roger Winger, as uh, he continues to battle with cancer. We also remember a number of other people who have asked not to be included in the public prayers, but uh, who are known to us who are also going through cancer treatment. We also received uh, word just before the service this morning that uh, Kevin Cumby's uh, brother, who lived up in Bracebridge, uh, uh, passed away very suddenly last night, uh, apparently due to a heart attack, and the family have asked for our prayers uh, at this uh, time of, of grief and sorrow. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, grant to your people courage that with boldness we may speak your name in witness to warn others that they, may, that, that they may come to faith and repentance and enjoy the forgiveness of their sins. Give to your church wisdom and strength by your spirit that she may be steadfast and unmovable in your word of truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our congregation and others who in coming days will reopen for in-person worship services. Grant your Holy Spirit to guide our plans and to bless our efforts that your people may worship you without fear all the days of their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, give to us good and honest leaders who will govern according to your word. Give us grace that we may not fail pray to those who lead us to act, as, that we may not fail to pray for those who lead us to act as good citizens and good neighbors to one another. Give peace to the nations. Bring an end to violence and prejudice and racism. Guide us to know and respect all life and to live in the revolutionary love that we have received in Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O Lord, you are the strength of the weak, the healing of the sick, the comfort for those who grieve, and the peace for those who are near death. Hear us on behalf of Pastor Roger Winger and all others who undergo treatments for cancer and other afflictions of body, mind, and spirit, that they may be strengthened in their afflictions and comforted in life and death and be delivered to everlasting life. Hear us also as we remember Kevin and his mother and his family as they receive this very difficult news of the passing of his brother. Comfort them with your Holy Spirit. Guide and direct them in the days ahead and assure them of the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to everlasting life which you have won for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, on this Labor Day weekend, we are reminded that you have given the day for work and the night for rest. Bless all honest labor and industry, artists and artisans, those in the caring profession. Keep us in humility and guard us against pride and arrogance. Give to us a spirit of generosity that we may share with others the blessings that flow from our labors. Be with those who are unemployed or underemployed, that they may find meaningful work and rejoice in their labors. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O Lord, deliver us from pandemic and pestilence, from disaster and danger and from sudden death. 
that kept in faith we may be preserved through this mortal life and in death be received into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting life. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray. Trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and gathered in his name and as he taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done done on earth earth as it is is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Take a few minutes just before we sing our closing hymn this morning to uh, welcome everyone again. If you didn't, uh, if you have a Gmail account and you're watching online and haven't signed in, please do so that we know that you've uh, been worshiping with us. Or if you don't have a Gmail account, uh, please send the church office an email. Uh, it's always nice to know uh, who's uh, joining us week by week. Uh, it's it's really been a blessing to us to to get to know some people uh, that way. Uh, Thanks to our uh, tech crew and also to our small little congregation. Uh, Over the last few Sundays, uh, you probably are aware, we've had a small group of people actually in attendance here as we prepare for next week. Uh, Next Sunday, September 13th, we will return to in-person services here at Holy Cross. Uh, Those services will be at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. And Sunday school will happen during the 9 o'clock service. All of this was sent out in a letter to every home, which you should have received by now, uh, and also in congregational email. But if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, Just a few things about that, just to make sure we're all on the same page. If you're coming to one of the services next Sunday or on Monday nights, those services will also continue. You need to register in advance because we are still under the 30% capacity guideline and we need to follow that. And uh, so we'll need to know in advance who's coming so that we can seat people so that we do not exceed uh, the guidelines. But uh, uh, beginning uh, this week, you can uh, RSVP to the church. There's an email address set up just for that. And uh, let us know that you're coming. And please be flexible. Um, if you'd like to come at, at 9 and that service happens to be full already, uh, consider 11, consider Monday. Be open to these things. It's, it's a tricky thing, um, but we will, uh, we will get there. Now, the 11 o'clock service will continue to be live streamed. Uh, and, and live streaming is, is probably, uh, well, not probably, is going to be part of our future for as long as we go on, I, I'm thinking. Um, and, uh, and, and so that service will continue to be available online for those who maybe can't uh, worship yet, don't feel comfortable being out with people, or maybe uh, can't, uh, uh, didn't get in in, in time and, and, and that sort of thing if, if the services fill up too quickly. 
Um, but uh, please remember all of that. And then also, you may be wondering what sort of services are we going to have. We're going back to the usual communion schedule of first and third Sundays of the month. Um, we will have uh, as normal a service as we can. Uh, the government has released some revised guidelines for public worship services, and uh, they are a little more open to public singing uh, than they have been as long as we are masked and remain physically distant um, and, and, and don't overdo it. Uh, it is sort of funny how the, the guidelines are written. That's not quite the words that they use, but that's sort of the basic upshot. As long as we control ourselves, um, there should be no problems, and they're quite happy to begin to allow group singing again, which we take to mean congregational singing. So, um, and then finally, uh, for tomorrow evening, if you're coming to church uh, tomorrow night, which will be our uh, Monday evening communion service um, with a different message, different theme than you've heard uh, this morning. Um, the sign-up uh, deadline for that is still tomorrow at noon. Uh, Debbie is going to be in the office for at least part of the day tomorrow, and uh, she will look after uh, receiving responses and putting together the seating plan uh, for the worship service tomorrow night. So um, that's the usual schedule for that. I think that's all that I, I need to announce uh, right now. Again, welcome to everybody who's uh, joined and a special welcome to those who are here this morning. It's the first time since March on a Sunday morning that uh, other than the... Um tech crew and the odd person who's happened to be here. We've actually had live people to look at uh, while I'm preaching. Um, those of you who've been in the church will know there's a giant TV in here, and usually I just get to watch myself preaching, which I don't find all that edifying, um, but it's nice to have some other people here that I can look at them uh, while I'm preaching and not just at myself. Anyway, our closing hymn this morning is um, uh, one of the better known versions of uh, the 23rd Psalm. Jesus talked about being the good shepherd. And then right after that, I don't often comment on postlude music at all, um, but uh, we're going to hear another uh, piece of music written by Bach that's also about shepherding. Uh, the interesting thing about the, the piece of music at the end, the well-known uh, song, Bach song, The Sheep May Safely Graze, is it's actually not about Jesus. Uh, we, we've kind of baptized it into the church, but it's actually from a, a secular cantata that Bach did, and uh, it talks about the sheep may safely graze when the shepherd cares for them. And the shepherd, in that case, that he's talking about is actually the ruler, uh, the, the governing authorities as they care for us. And we've kind of baptized it into church usage, not only because of Jesus, the good shepherd, but also to recognize the shepherding uh, that uh, those in authority do. So we join together to sing our closing hymn, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want, followed by the postlude, The Sheep May Safely Graze. Thank you. 